the PCE3 seminar organizing uh, group that is me, Becca Guth Metzler, uh, James Iguchi, Albert Fehrenbach, and Danielle Simkis. And I'll also introduce that PCE3 has a brand new uh, communications team. So we are very happy to have on board for that um, Eliza Bondi, Ishan Madden, Laura Rodriguez, Zoe Todd, and Jeremy Tran. Um, so I particularly want to welcome anyone new to this series, and I'll just uh, state briefly what the purpose of this series is. It is to showcase all the great work that's going on at the forefront of prebiotic chemistry and early earth environment research. Um, again, by early career individuals who highlight that and bring that to you. Um, so uh, we are continuing along the same format as what we did last year. So that's a seminar every three weeks at this same time. We are adding in this year, we're exploring different themes. So we will try to organize each session around a single theme and try to bring in different perspectives under that theme. Um, so the theme for today is reducing atmospheres. So uh, today we'll uh, hear from, and let me actually share my slide for this. Uh, we'll have a brief introduction and that's from Dr. David Catling, and I'll get that up for you in a second. There we are. So um, a brief introduction by Dr. David Catling, professor at the University of Washington. And then we will hear from our early career researchers. So that's Nick Wogan and Nathan Reed. Oh, and while I'm here, I will mention in this corner, we see the uh, Twitter account that you can follow for PCE3 started up by that uh, science communications team. So please, please find them on Twitter. They would be very excited to have you. Uh, so with that, we'll move into the introduction by Dr. David Catling. So um, I have a bio here for him. David Catling is a professor in earth and space sciences at the University of Washington, Seattle. He's a plan planetary scientist and geo and astrobiologist whose research deals with planetary habitability, including exploration of Mars and how the environment and life on Earth co-evolved over billions of years. In addition to many scholarly papers, he's also well known for two books he wrote in the past decade, For the Layperson, Astrobiology, A Very Short Introduction, and for researchers with Jim Casting, Atmospheric Evolution on Inhabited and Lifeless Worlds. Uh, so you can take it away, Dr. David Gatling. Okay, um, let me just uh, share my screen. Yes, thank you. There you go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so I just have a few slides, and this is just to introduce the talks by uh, Nick Wogan and Nathan Reed. And I thought it would be useful to start with, so they're all on the same page, what a reducing atmosphere is, then it's linked to the origin of life, and just a few words on current research. But hopefully, uh, my intention is to convince you that early reducing air was inevitable, and uh, it would have made prebiotic, prebiotically relevant molecules. So, um, what is a reducing atmosphere? <clears throat> well, I mean, you could define it in different ways, but, but for practical purposes, uh, it's useful to think of hydrogen poor and hydrogen rich atmospheres. And we have examples in our own solar system. And by hydrogen rich, this term includes hydrogen containing, reducing gases, uh, such as methane and others. <clears throat> so more generally, it's rich in gases that, that will easily donate electrons in a redox reaction. In the case of Titan, in the lower atmosphere, there's 5% methane. Uh, most of the rest is nitrogen, but that's a, a highly reducing atmosphere. In the case of the giant planets, um, there's 80s of percent of hydrogen, so they're very reducing. Um, 
But then we can also think of the rocky planets. So the pre-oxygenated Earth uh, was a reducing atmosphere, albeit uh, not as rich in hydrogen as these other ones that I've talked about. And probably Mars at some point uh, deep in its history had a reducing atmosphere. And then we can think of oxidizing atmospheres. So today's um, atmosphere of the Earth, very hydrogen poor, 0.5 parts per million uh, hydrogen, and Mars, uh, similarly hydrogen poor and full of oxidized gases like CO2. And this is a useful way to think about atmospheres because it indicates the chemical character, whether, for example, carbon is oxidized or hydrogenated, also the aerosols, whether you're liable to form organics or elemental sulfur, for example, in reducing air versus sulfate in the oxidizing atmospheres of, say, the Earth's stratosphere. Um, but it's also useful to think about something that's strongly or weakly reducing. So this little pie chart here in the upper part, <clears throat> we have very hydrogenated uh, forms of, say, nitrogen and carbon. So that's uh, strongly uh, reducing. And at the bottom, we've got predominantly the oxidized forms of nitrogen and, and carbon, but with some minor uh, hydrogen methane. So we'd call that a weakly uh, reducing atmosphere. So what's the link to the origin of life? I'm sure um, people already know this kind of history that uh, Alexander Oprah and, and John Haldane proposed in the 1920s, uh, the idea that the early atmosphere had no oxygen because that requires life, photosynthesis. And in such reducing air, they argued photochemistry would generate organic molecules. And around the same time, in 1927, the first paper was published with geolog geologic evidence from the Archean Earth that the atmosphere was anoxic uh, from looking at um, the oxidation state of iron in sedimentary rocks. And then the Oprah and Haldane hypothesis, as it was called, was <coughs> demonstrated in the famous Miller-Urey experiment showing on the left-hand side of this slide, where you'd, you'd make such a reducing atmosphere in a flask, uh, stick an electric spark through it, and you'd make amino acids. And um, subsequent experiments and analyses have shown you can make 10 or, or 14 if you tweak the mixture um, or the experiment enough of the 20 common protein forming amino acids. But uh, geologists, geochemists um, disputed that such an atmosphere existed. They argued that when we look at atmospheres today and the input to the atmospheres, so if you look at the lower right, when you look at what's coming out of volcanoes, the predominant gases are mostly oxidized. So the oxidized form of hydrogen, namely water vapor, is the predominant gas of volcanoes. The earth is just letting off steam and uh, most of the carbon is CO2 and nitrogen. So there was a argument from geochemists that maybe the Miller-Urey atmosphere never existed uh, because except briefly before the core of the earth formed and iron was mixed in to the mantle and uh, the reducing mantle would give rise to reducing gases. Nonetheless, uh, people who worked in organic chemistry, um, to, in prebiotic organic chemistry, the need for the reducing atmospheres, especially the production of cyanides, uh, which are used to make uh, the nucleobases, never really went away. And some people never gave up on this idea, particularly Stanley Miller, but also others like Carl Sagan. And <clears throat> more recently, the Miller-Urey atmosphere has returned. And it's returned because people realize that um, there's something inevitable that happens by the earth, which that it gets hit by impacts and large impactors have iron cores and the iron can react with water and release hydrogen. So if the asteroid hitting the early earth is big enough, it will make a hydrogen rich atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, the hydrogen will reduce the CO2 if, uh, to methane. So you end up with a Miller-Urey atmosphere in a couple of papers, recent papers, one by Steve Benner et al, and Kevin Zanli et al talk about this. In fact, um, Yuri himself suggested this in a 1952 paper, but it got somewhat forgotten. And it's worth quoting what he said. He said, Impacts, impactors containing metallic iron uh, nickel alloy fell on the moon and the earth at the terminal stage of their formation. I regard this as certain 
and it is difficult in this subject to be certain about anything, reactions taking place at the time would include the, re uh, the reduction of water uh, by iron to make hydrogen. One sees that hydrogen was a prominent constituent of the primitive atmosphere, and hence that methane was as well. Where in that last statement, he's uh, implying uh, that you can make the methane given so much hydrogen <clears throat> in the post-impact atmosphere. And in a such a milliuri atmosphere, you can make cyanides. And these this table just shows um, precursors and possible secondary products for the synthesis of components of RNA building blocks. Uh, HCN, hydrogen cyanide is precursor uh, for these uh, nucleobases. And, um, what, and also in some cases, for example, cyanoacetylene, which is used in prebiotic schemes to make pyrimidines, there's no source that is as plausible and as certain as a source from a highly reducing atmosphere. So this motivates us to think about milliuri type atmospheres. And we have examples of reducing atmospheres, as I mentioned before, in the solar system. Uh, we have Titan, which is <clears throat> in the lower atmosphere, 95% hydrogen, 5% methane, essentially. And when we look at Titan, we see that it uh, is covered in this organic haze. The principle here is that atmospheric reactions are driven by radicals, species with unpaired electrons. And then these uh, radicals, which are very re reactive, can then combine in various ways to make more complicated molecules. And the radicals themselves, um, the initial source is, is usually photolysis. So for example, methane splits into bits, um, radicals, and then these can combine with nitrogen atoms to make cyanides that can combine with each other to make heavy organics, which can then photolyze to make more radicals, which combine with uh, previous products to eventually end up as a haze. And this happens uh, in the lab when the, H, when the CH4 to CO2 ratio is greater than about 0.1, roughly. Now there's a difference, which is that the early earth was far warmer than Titan. Titan's surface temperature is about 94 Kelvin. And so the earth, early earth would have contained oxygen, uh, gases with oxygen atoms, such as CO2 and H2O, which are frozen on the surface of, of Titan. And also volcanoes would have supplied sulfur gases. So lab experiments are needed to know the properties of an early earth haze and what exactly the chemistry would, that would go on in this more complicated situation. But the take home from my intro is that the um, that highly reducing air was inevitable on early earth after big impacts, and it would have made prebiotically relevant molecules. And that um, is a segue into the next talk by Nick Wogan. So Nick, if you'd like to go ahead, or actually are you gonna be introduced by Rebecca, I guess? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes, I'll jump in here with his bio as well. Let me just get that pulled up. All right, so that's right. Next we're hearing from Nick Wogan. Nick Wogan is a fifth year PhD student in the Earth and Space Sciences Department and Astrobiology program at the University of Washington. While there, Nick has been investigating the evolution of the Hadean and Archean Earth atmosphere using photochemical models. This research has largely focused on estimating the production rates of key origin of life molecules, such as hydrogen cyanide, in hydrogen-rich atmospheres caused by giant asteroid impacts on early Earth. So whenever you're ready, Nick, you can share and take it away. Yep. Um, okay, can you see my screen? We can. Okay, great. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick Wogan. Um, I'm a graduate student and at the University of Washington, and I'm working with David Catling, who you just heard from. He's my advisor, and I also work with Kevin Zonley. He's another mentor. And today I'm going to talk about origin of life photochemistry and reducing atmospheres after large impacts on the early Earth. So this talk has two parts. First is some background. Uh, I'll talk about reducing atmospheres and the origin of life. And then second are some results. I will show photochemical simulations of reducing atmospheres 
after big asteroid impacts on the early Earth. So let's get started with some background. So this seminar is about reducing atmospheres. Um, why? Why focus on this? Why are reducing atmospheres relevant to the origin of life? Well, David talked about this for about five minutes, but I'm going to elaborate it, on it in the next few minutes. And I want to explain to you specifically why reducing atmospheres are relevant to one idea for the origin of life, the RNA world hypothesis. Reducing atmospheres are relevant to other ideas, but I will focus on RNA world just to give a concrete example. So the RNA world hypothesis, it is the idea that RNA was an early lifelike molecule on the early earth to replicate and evolve by Darwin's natural selection. The idea is, is once you have a replicating RNA molecule that can pass genetic information to its descendants, then evolution could perhaps take care of the rest and you could evolve to more and more complicated molecules and ultimately produce cells. So here we have a cartoon of an RNA molecule. It is made of smaller molecules strung together called nucleotides. Well, sort of the first thing that comes to mind when you consider the RNA world hypothesis is where did the first RNA molecules come from? How did these relatively complicated molecules form on the early earth? Well, this pr problem and this question is not solved, but people have done some really incredible work on it. People have shown that with hydrogen cyanide and H2S or sulfite and UV light, you can make nucleotide precursors. So that's the precursors to the building blocks of RNA. And other similar research has shown that with phosphate and a few other prebiotic molecules like cyanoacetylene, you can make cytosine and uracil nucleotides. So you can make two of the four nucleotides of RNA. So all of this is very exciting and interesting, but where would these ingredients come from? Where would the hydrogen cyanide, the sulfur, and the UV light come from? Well, UV light could come from the sun and sulfur could come from volcanoes, but the source of hydrogen cyanide and also cyanoacetylene, the, the source of those molecules is less obvious. Well, as David talked about a bit ago, the most likely source is probably reducing methane atmospheric chemistry. So this is where reducing atmospheres comes into the RNA origin of life hypothesis. Um, reducing methane atmospheric chemistry is perhaps required to produce molecules like hydrogen cyanide, and cyanoacetylene, which are critical, at least in the lab, for producing RNA precursors. So we know that reducing methane atmospheric chemistry makes these molecules because it happens on Titan, as David mentioned. And key to this is methane. You can't just have a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. A hydrogen-rich atmosphere would be a very reducing atmosphere, um, but a pure hydrogen-rich atmosphere it wouldn't produce hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene. You need methane, it's, it's key. So was the Hadean Earth atmosphere reducing? Did it contain a lot of methane? Well, there is a geologic argument that the Hadean atmosphere did not have much methane at all, and instead had a CO2 and nitrogen dominated atmosphere most of the time. This geologic argument goes something like this, Volcanic gases should have supplied the Hadean atmosphere. Modern volcanoes outgas water, CO2, and nitrogen, and not their reduced equivalents, hydrogen, methane, and ammonia. The oxidation state of the mantle is, has probably not changed a lot since core formation. So Hadean volcanoes produced a CO2 nitrogen atmosphere. So this idea has been argued about and um, for, for several decades. But there is some reasonable evidence to support this hypothesis. The geochemistry of the oldest zircon grains, which are about 4.3 billion years old, suggests that the Earth's mantle redox state has not changed a lot. These data points have pretty big air bars, so they have to be taken with a grain of salt. Also, iron oxide disproportionation during planet formation should oxidize the upper mantle, making or causing uh, 
volcanoes to outgas oxidized gases. So what is the solution to this redox paradox? An RNA origin of life may require a reducing atmosphere containing methane, but conventional wisdom says that the Hadean atmosphere was CO2 nitrogen rich most of the time. Well, as David alluded to, one possible solution is that large asteroid impacts could have produced methane. I will explain this idea with this diagram here. So on the left, we have, a CO, we have the Hadean Earth with a CO2 and nitrogen dominated atmosphere. We can imag imagine a very big iron rich impactor that is going to collide with the Hadean Earth. This impactor is bigger than about 100 kilometers in diameter. So how big is this? Well, recently there was a very great film that came out called Don't Look Up. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen it because it's, it's about space. And many people here are interested in these sorts of things. Um, and it's about the world ending from a nine kilometer comet impact. And so the impacts I'm talking about here are way bigger, um, way bigger than that. They're 100 kilometer asteroid impacts. So this impact, it would, it would vaporize a good portion of the ocean and make a steam atmosphere. And then iron delivered by the impactor core would react with steam to make hydrogen. And then hydrogen could equilibrate with carbon to make methane. So then the steam atmosphere would condense after about a thousand years and you'd be left with an atmosphere with hydrogen, CO2, nitrogen, and also some methane. So you'd have an atmosphere that would probably make molecules like hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene, these molecules that are very important in an RNA world origin of life. So we developed models of atmospheric evolution after large asteroid impacts. For the rest of this talk, I will show simulation results, including estimations of how much hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene would have been produced in atmospheres after big impacts. So here is our modeling approach. We split the post-impact atmosphere into two different parts. We have one model for the steam atmosphere that happens right after the impact. And we have another model for the photochemical evolution of the atmosphere after the steam condenses. So this portion, the photochemical evolution, lasts for millions of years. So for the steam atmosphere, we use a zero-dimensional chemical kinetics model. It has 100 species and about 500 forward gas phase reactions. Um, so it tracks the chemistry of the steam atmosphere as it cools. And then for photochemical evolution, we use a one-dimensional photochemical model. Our one-dimensional photochemical model reproduces the modern Earth, the methane chemistry on Saturn, and it also reproduces the important Titan cyanide chemistry. So just to briefly show you, here is our one-dimensional photochemical model uh, validated against Titan. So this plot shows concentrations of gases in the atmosphere as a function of altitude in Titan's atmosphere. The lines are model predictions and the dots are observations of the atmosphere. So it's nice to see that our predictions of hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene, uh, roughly speaking, match up with the observations. So here are some model results. This is the Hadean atmosphere after a 1000 kilometer asteroid impact. So on the x-axis of this plot is time in years, and on the y-axis is abundance of each molecule in the atmosphere. Before the impact, we start with a CO2 nitrogen atmosphere. At time equals zero, we have a 1000 kilometer impact, which makes a hot steam atmosphere. As the steam cools, methane forms because methane is thermodynamically preferred at colder temperatures. But eventually the steam gets so cold that the reactions that make methane become very slow. And so that's why methane plateaus in abundance towards the end of the steam atmosphere. So after 1000 years, the steam condenses to an ocean and then the atmosphere continues to evolve photochemically. And so methane and nitrogen photochemistry generates hydrogen cyanide, which is in blue. So this is the hydrogen cyanide surface pressure reference to the right hand axis. So about 10 to the minus eight bar of hydrogen cyanide persists for millions of years. And 
So here's cyanoacetylene surface pressure, um, about just under 10 to the minus nine bar. Cyanoacetylene persists for millions of years as well. So here is another look at that same simulation, the 1000 kilometer asteroid impact. This is a movie. On the left-hand side are mixing ratios of each gas in the atmosphere um, as a function of altitude. So you'll wanna pay attention to hydrogen cyanide in blue, cyanoacetylene in brown, and also hydrocarbon aerosols in pink. On the right are photons hitting the top of the atmosphere in blue and the surface in orange. And it's as a function of wavelength uh, in nanometers. So, and here is time in years. So pretty quickly, a hydrocarbon aerosol layer forms and it blocks out much of the ultraviolet light um, from hitting the surface of the earth. And while the haze is around, um, these hydrocarbon aerosol haze, um, a lot of hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene is produced, and there's pretty high surface concentrations. This model stops at 5 million years because this is about the time it takes for hydrogen to escape to space. So after about this period of time, the hydrogen would escape, and the atmosphere would slowly evolve back to its CO2 and nitrogen-dominated state. So in the simulation I just showed you, methane has a 30 million year lifetime. This is very long. The Archean Earth atmosphere has a 10,000 year lifetime and the modern Earth atmosphere has a 10 year lifetime of methane. So the methane lifetime is so long because these atmospheres are hydrogen rich. So when methane is split apart by ultraviolet light, it just recombines uh, with reactions with hydrogen. This is important because methane will persist in the atmosphere, generating hydrogen cyanide until hydrogen escapes to space. This takes something like one to 10 million years. So for this entire period of time, one to 10 million years, hydrogen cyanide and perhaps cyanoacetylene is being produced. So here we have methane and hydrogen cyanide or cyanoacetylene versus impact or size. So the left-hand side shows methane surface mixing ratio as a function of time after the impact. And the right-hand side is hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene. The different lines are different sized impacts. So they're, they're simulations of the atmosphere after different sized impacts. The solid line is a 400 kilometer impact. And then it goes bigger and bigger all the way up to the stars, which is a 1000 kilometer impact. There is a pretty clear relationship between methane and impact or size. Bigger impacts make more methane. This is because bigger impacts deliver more iron, which chemically reduces the atmosphere more, uh, which makes methane favorable during the steam atmosphere phase. So the same relationship is true with hydrogen cyanide, but it's much more nonlinear. As you increase impact or size, hydrogen cyanide the surface concentration goes up exponentially. So for the biggest impact, the surface concentration is about 10 to the minus nine surface mixing, ra mixing ratio. And then for all the smaller impactors, it's less than 10 parts per trillion at the surface. So for cyanoacetylene, it's, it's even more exponential. Only the biggest impact, the thousand kilometer impact produces any cyanoacetylene at all. All the smaller impactors don't really produce any. So in the next slide, I wanna take a closer look at hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene production at, in all of these model runs at 10,000 years after the impact. So here's that closer look. This plot shows the net production rate of hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene for each of those simulations 10,000 years after the impact. So the blue bars are Product, hydrogen cyanide production from photochemistry. The blue hashed bars are hydrogen cyanide production from lightning. And the brown bar is uh, cyanoacetylene production from photochemistry. And also this dashed line is a DN earth hydrogen cyanide from comet delivery as estimated by Zoe Todd in her 2020 paper. So um, it looks like for impactors about 700 kilometers or bigger. Um, hydrogen cyanide from photochemistry is the dominant uh, way to produce hydrogen cyanide. And then for the biggest impact, 
um, hydrogen cyanide from photochemistry is definitely the dominant mechanism for producing hydrogen cyanide. So here we have estimated surface temperature versus impactor size. This plot on the left, on the, on the y-axis is the lower bound estimated surface temperature as a function of impactor diameter. So these temperature estimates are for the same period of time that hydrogen cyanide is being produced. So for the smaller impactors, the 500 kilometer impactors, the surface temperature might be a, a little bit above 320 Kelvin. But for the biggest impactor, the surface temperature might be 370, 380 Kelvin or greater. The reason why these atmospheres are hot are because they are hydrogen rich and they have pretty high surface pressures. So here are the surface pressures for each simulation. And so hydrogen collision induced absorption in these high pressure atmospheres is a pretty effective greenhouse gas. So recently, Caitlin Cerillo published her master's thesis, um, and it has some relevant climate calculations to all of this. Um, she used a more sophisticated climate model than the one I used to produce this plot on the left. And she did one climate model that was similar um, to our 1000 kilometer impactor case. So similar to this point here, she found that the surface temperature would be about 630 Kelvin. So very toasty, warm. But this leads us to a bit of a problem our photochemical model suggests larger asteroid impacts cause exponentially larger hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene production. But after really large impacts, the global average surface temperature is greater than 380 Kelvin for millions of years. This is not good for making long, delicate RNA molecules. The surface conditions while hydrogen cyanide is produced is very similar to the conditions in my instant pot, which is at two bars pressure and uh, 390 Kelvin. So pretty harsh condi conditions. So how can this problem be resolved? Well, there are a few possible solutions. Um, so if we included metal catalysts, then our model of the steam post-impact atmosphere might predict more methane for small impacts. The overall result would be more hydrogen cyanide produced during temperate surface conditions. So if there were metal catalysts present, speeding up the reactions that make methane in the steam atmosphere, this would ultimately lead to more hydrogen cyanide during maybe temp surface temperatures less than uh, 350 Kelvin. This possible solution is challenging to investigate from a modeling perspective because catalysts are hard to model. It is hard to know how many catalysts would be around on the early earth and in these post-impact environments. So another solution is that hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene could be preserved on earth's surface and used in prebiotic chemistry after the atmosphere cools down. So for example, cyanide might be preserved as a sodium ferrocyanide salt. Um, this was something that was looked at in Toner and Catling 2019. So that is all I have for you. I will leave you with a quick summary. Reducing methane-rich atmospheres generate hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene, which are critical molecules in an RNA origin of life. Large asteroid impacts on the early Earth could have possibly generated transient methane-rich atmospheres. Our one-dimensional photochemical model suggests a 1,000 kilometer impact can produce about 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus eight bar surface hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene persisting on hydrogen escape timescales. So one to 10 million years. While this hydrogen cyanide is produced, the surface temperatures are probably greater than 380 Kelvin. Larger impacts result in exponentially larger hydrogen cyanide production and we find that only the greater than 1,000 kilometer impacts produce cyanoacetylene. All the smaller impacts produce very, very small amounts. So that is all I have. And um, I think we'll do questions at the end if there are any. So thank you very much.
Yes. Thank you so much, Nick. We are going to give Nathan an opportunity to talk now and then, like Nick said, take questions for everyone at the end. So let me um, just jump into Nathan's bio. All right, so Nathan received his BS in chemistry from the University of Illinois in 2017. He is currently a fifth year PhD student in analytical and atmospheric chemistry at the University, University of Colorado Boulder and is co-advised by Maggie Tolbert and Eleanor Brown. Nathan conducts lab experiments on planetary organic case chemistry applied to Saturn's moon Titan and early Earth and exoplanets. So whenever you're ready, Nathan, you can go ahead and share. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just go ahead and set up. Hopefully you can see my presentation. We can. Um, great. Uh, thank you for all for uh, coming. Uh, my name is Nathan Reed. Um, uh, I am co-advised by Maggie Tolbert and Eleanor Brown at the University of Colorado, and I also work in collaboration with Professor Boswell Wing, who's a professor in the geology department at CU. Um, today, I'll be talking about the role of hydrogen sulfide in planetary organic haze chemistry. And the picture I'm showing in my background here is of Volcano Island. It's an island of Italy. And the reason I'm showing this is because I'll be talking about hydrogen sulfide today. And on this uh, island in these fumaroles and these volcanic fumaroles, um, they've actually measured hydrogen sulfide uh, along with SO2 coming out of the uh, being outgassed from this volcano. So it's predominantly thought, uh, that's been mentioned a couple of times, that volcanoes uh, will outgas the oxidized forms of uh, molecules, so SO2 in the case of sulfur. But H2S in this modern volcano uh, was measured, and um, in some cases uh, it was outgassed in higher fluxes than SO2. Um, so along with H2S, I'll be talking about organic haze chemistry. And actually, sulfur gases and organic hazes are ubiquitous in planetary atmospheres. So uh, in our solar system, both sulfur gases and hazes are quite common. So uh, we have sulfur gases and a haze on Venus, Jupiter, Saturn. Um, most no a notable example, like we were talking about before, is Titan, uh, Uranus. And even beyond our solar system, possibly exoplanets have uh, likely have sulfur gases and organic haze. And today I'll be talking about uh, the early Earth example of sulfur gases and an organic haze. So just kind of going over quickly, this was uh, mentioned briefly in the introductory slides about um, planetary organic haze formation from CH4 photolysis. And Titan is this very good example um, that we have that we can observe of a methane rich atmosphere that has an organic haze. Um, so Titan's atmosphere is predominantly nitrogen and it has about five to 6% methane. So if we have this high amount of methane in the atmosphere, this can react with ultraviolet light from the sun and it splits into these two photochemical products that can react with each other to combine and combine to form more complex organic molecules that can also photolyze and continue to react. And this process uh, continues to, until we produce more and more complex organic molecules. And eventually these molecules condense out into aerosol particles that we call the organic haze. And so the methane photolysis is key here. And what was mentioned before is um, the methane could have been on an early earth. Um, and where I'm looking and thinking about is methane on the Archean earth. It's a solution to the faint young sung paradox. Um, and what I'm looking at is that chemistry of the Archean uh, methane. So what's the current thought of Archean organic haze and sulfur. We also have sulfur gases coming from volcanoes on the Archean. So uh, it's very similar to Titan where we have uh, methane on the Archean earth likely coming from volcanoes, um, but also possibly surface life. It can come from methanogenesis. Um, so this will react with ultraviolet light to create the more complex organic molecules that will condense out into organic haze. Um, and what we've been talking about today is how these complex organic molecules can produce biologically relevant molecules, um, which can be deposited on the surface from an organic haze. Um, the organic haze can also interact with incoming light, which affects the radiative forcing on the planet, so it can affect, it can affect the climate. And then with sulfur gases, these also likely come from volcanoes. We have 
Uh, it's usually thought predominantly to be SO2, but we can also have H2S. These can, um, maybe they can interchange through some kind of redox chemistry. Um, and it's currently thought that these also interact with ultraviolet lights um, to produce um, what's, you know, historically been thought to be elemental sulfur, SA aerosol, or H2SO4 uh, aerosol. So two main sulfur reservoirs are thought to be on the air came, or, uh, from the atmosphere. And this, this photolysis process um, causes what's called a mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes, where the uh, S8s uh, will carry, would carry the positive uh, sulfur uh, mass independent fractionation or the s -myth, and then the H2SO4 would carry the negative. So we have to have these two different reservoirs to be able to see this fractionation. And then when these deposit on the surface, um, this can show up as a, the SMIF signature in the Archaean uh, sediment records. So how these two uh, processes are related, um, historically how they thought to have been related is if we increase the methane uh, flux, so we get more methane in the atmosphere, we can increase the organic haze that's formed. And for the organic haze, if it's getting uh, thicker and thicker, could eventually block out the relevant wavelengths of UV light uh, that cause this H2S or SO2 photolysis, which would shut off the SNIF signature. So we can kind of look at this in terms of geological time. So I'm showing here is a figure from Farquhar and Wing, 2003. On the y-axis, we have the mass independent fractionation of uh, sulfur 33. And on the x-axis, we have uh, the age of uh, the earth. We're at zero is today. Um, and you can see that this, um, this isotope fractionation is not present um, in, the, in this large section. And this is what's thought at the end of the Archaean, we get this increase of oxygen in the atmosphere, we get an ozone layer, and that shuts off the relevant wavelengths of UV lights, um, just as similar to how the organic haze did in my little animation there. Um, but we, what we can also look at are these little dips uh, uh, in the in the isotope fractionation. Um, so this has been proposed to be whiffs of oxygen um, that cause you know, a brief uh, shut off of this uh, isotope fractionation, but also it's been proposed that an organic haze can also uh, cause this, an intermittent organic haze. So the current view um, between sulfur and organic haze is uh, there's an indirect interaction where we have the organic haze blocking the UV lights, uh, but the chemistries are completely separated. We don't have any of the sulfur gases reacting with any of the organic uh, molecules uh, in the atmosphere. So uh, the question of my studies are, uh, what are the direct interactions? What are the direct chemical interactions, if any? Um, and how are these chemistries, how could these chemistries be coupled? So I'm not the first one to ask a question, the, these kinds of questions. So there's been some previous work coupling sulfur and haze chemistry. So DeWitt et al. 2010 looked at uh, SO2 and CH4 photochemistry. And what they found is they saw uh, H2SO4 aerosol being produced, just as it's commonly thought as a reservoir for sulfur in the arcane atmosphere. But they also observed organic sulfur aerosol, which is not typically thought of as a major sulfur reservoir uh, for arcane sulfur in the atmosphere. They also observed S8 uh, at a fairly high SO2 concentration, about 2000 ppm. Uh, a more recent study by Hia al. 2020 looked at H2S, but in a CO2 rich uh, atmosphere, the CO2 rich photochemistry. And what they observed is that they had an enhanced haze. They had a lot more organic aerosol forming. But they also observed organic sulfur gases. So again, we see these orga this organic sulfur forming from this sulfur and haze chemistry. So my first uh, project that I'm going to go over is how would trace H2S, and trace meaning in my studies 5 ppm or less, um, affect a haze chemistry in just a CH4 rich atmosphere, not CO2. So how I do this is um, I do laboratory experiments. Um, so I have tanks of uh, uh, the gases I want to study, so in this case H2S, CH4, and N2. Um, in my experiments, I kept CH4 constant at 0.1%, and then between experiments, I would vary the H2S concentration between 0 and 5 ppm. And then the rest of the gas is predominantly nitrogen. So I'd flow these into a mixing cell, and these would mix overnight to ensure thorough mixing. 
And then once I'm ready for the experiments, I would flow it from the mixing cell using a mass flow controller into a reaction chamber. It's just a stainless steel cylinder with a UV lamp uh, attached to it. So the UV lamp initiates the UV photochemistry to create the organic particles. And then these flow directly uh, in line in real time to a quadrupole aerosol mass spectrometer or a QAMS and, or, uh, and an SMPS or it's called a scanning mobility particle sizer. Um, so before I go into what those are, I wanna emphasize that in my experiments, I'm only measuring the particles. I'm not measuring any of the gases that are being formed. The gases are pumped away before they're measured. So the quadrupole aerosol mass spectrometer, or the QAMS, uh, this is gonna tell us the aerosol mass. So how much uh, of the particle mass, how much particles are we making? What's the total mass? And also the particle composition. We can get that from the mass spectra. So we get what's called an aerosol mass spectrum. So we can deduce the composition of the particles. Uh, the SMPS uh, can tell us the number of particles we make, and it can also show us the size distribution. So uh, how many particles and how big are uh, in my talk today, I'm mainly going to focus on the QAMS uh, results. So uh, what were the results? The, in the QAMS results, um, we saw that adding H2S significantly increased the aerosol mass. So uh, what I'm showing here in this figure is just the total aerosol mass loading that the mass spectrometer measures versus how much H2S we included in the mixture. So again, we just had 0.1% methane, and then we varied the H2S. And you can see that by the time we get to five ppm H2S, the total mass of the aerosol increased by almost three. Um, but, uh, so it's three times, oh, it's 2.8 times greater than without H2S. And this is mainly organic aerosol. So we're increasing organic aerosol without an additional carbon source. We're only adding trace H2S and we kept the methane constant at 0.1%. Another way we can visualize this is by looking at the spectrum. And we can see that most of the masses in the spectrum increase with signal with H2S. So in this mass spectrum, we're just showing the signal of each ion or the MZ. And so this black spectrum here, this is just the 0.1% methane and nitrogen. And you could, this spectrum is what we typically expect with the methane photolysis, and this is organic aerosol. But if we put behind it the spectrum of one ppm H2S, so these aren't stacked on top of each other, they're just overlaid, uh, we see an increase at almost every mass. And then what we do, and this continues to increase as we add more and more H2S. So we add three, and then we add five. So H2S is just increasing how much carbon is in the aerosol. And again, it's not a carbon source. We're only adding trace H2S, and yet more carbon is being included in the aerosol. And if you look more closely at these spectra, you can see that there's other masses popping up when we include H2S that weren't there before when we didn't have any H2S. And so the question is, uh, what are these ma new masses? And we have evidence that these masses when we include H2S that show up is organic reduced sulfur or what we're calling ORS. So things like thiols and sulfides. Um, a better way to like, think about um, to look at this is asking, okay, well, if all the ions are being enhanced with, H2, with H2S, which ions are enhanced the most? So we can do this by looking at what's called an enhancement ratio. So what this is, is we take a spectrum of an experiment with H2S and we divide it by its control or its experiment with no H2S. And we can get what this enhancement mass spectra. Um, so what this is, it's basically comparing the experiments with H2S than without H2S. So uh, by uh, the MZ or the ion basis. So you can see that if we see a tick, that means the, um, that means that that ion was enhanced with H2S. And so, like I said, most masses are enhanced. So we see all of these, we can see that most masses are more with H2S than without, but some of them are much greater. So like, and they're in these groups. So we have 32 through 35, 45 through 49, and so on. And if we look at these masses, they're actually, uh, they're actually associated with and consistent with organic sulfur compounds like thiols and sulfides, these organic reduced sulfur compounds. So another way we can kind of think about this and kind of pull out how much of it, this is organic sulfur is we can do an analysis technique called um, delta analysis. And what that is, is we basically look at the fragmentation patterns of, of the 
we look at common fragmentation patterns of the mass spectra, which can give us a bulk composition of the aerosol. So when we do this, we see an increasing contribution of thiol and sulfide masses. So just for a reminder, a thiol is the sulfur bound to a hydrogen and a carbon, and a sulfide is a, a sulfur bound between two carbon molecules. And so uh, if we look at what the contribution uh, to the bulk uh, composition of the aerosol, uh, how these change as a function of H2S, um, we see that we get more of the, or the thiols and sulfides uh, as a function of H2S mixing ratio. So the fraction of the total signal of the uh, thiols and sulfide masses is increasing up to almost 20% by the time we get to uh, 5 ppm H2S. So we're actually changing the composition of the aerosol and making these organic sulfur compounds and more of them as we get more H2S. Um, so this is an increasing in fraction of the total signal. So there has to be something that's decreasing. If something's increasing in fraction, something's decreasing. And if we look at that, if we do the same method where this delta analysis, where we look at the bulk composition of the aerosol, we can see that the decreasing fractions are actually uh, the unsaturated carbon chains of like alkenes, dienes, and alkynes. These decrease as a function of alkene or of H2S mixing ratio. So this can actually suggest this increasing in organic sulfur and decreasing alkenes suggests a possible mechanism. So it's known that these unsaturated uh, carbon chains, uh, such as alkenes and, alk and alkynes, uh, form in haze chemistry. And the H2S, main H2S metallicis pathway we uh, think is occurring in our system uh, produces this uh, thiol radical. And actually there's uh, what's called thiolene click chemistry. That's this chemistry between this thiol radical and these alkenes. And this thiolene click chemistry is actually quite common in uh, synthesis research. Um, so this can be thought of somewhat analogous to OH radical chemistry in the modern atmosphere. So if we look at this mechanism, we have our initial mixture of just H2S and methane. And then when we photolyze it, we produce the thiol radical. And then the methane, as we talked about, uh, goes through a couple different reactions after photolysis to form these alkynes, these uh, unsaturated hydro hydrocarbon chains. Then the thiol radical can react with this, um, with these uh, alkenes, and, and then it can form a thiol uh, once this radical is uh, capped. So the radical is propagated down the carbon chain, and once it's capped, this can then these thiols can then uh, photolyze themselves, and then these can react further with more available alkenes uh, to create the sulfides, and then continue to propagate the radical down the carbon chain. And what else could happen is that these radicals, before they, before they are capped by, say, a hydrogen, they can react with more alkenes to produce a chain growth and propagate the radical even further down the carbon chain. And this can continue and continue and continue. And so this sort of mechanism, uh, this thiolene click chemistry, can kind of explain the two results we saw with the methane and with, with the methane and the H2S experiments, where we see the organic sulfur or the thiol and the sulfides. And we also saw the increase in total organics. So not just that those total organics just don't come from organic sulfur, we have all those masses increasing. And that can be explained by this uh, radical propagation and this chain growth. So we're talking about uh, prebiotic chemistry and the biologically relevant molecules and uh, organic sulfur, that's an important biomolecule. Um, but we are talking about the arcane earth and the arcane earth had CO2. And so what, what difference does that make? Well, it's known that CO2 would, will eventually decrease the haze formation um, if there's a high enough concentration. Um, so Trainer et al. 2006 did very ex similar experiments to what I did with CO2 and CH4. Um, and it's, it was thought before the, this research that there would be no haze with high CO2, but Trainer showed that there is some haze. Um, but you can see from this plot where we have the AMS mass loading on the left versus the CO2 concentration on the bottom, um, where this point is 0.1% CO2 with 0.1% methane. And then this point is 0.5% CO2 with 0.1% methane. So you can see there's just that decrease in total aerosol. So we're getting less haze, but there is still some. So uh, our question is, is we, we want to apply this research to the, research to the arcane earth. Um, what would happen if we have both H2S 
and CO2. So H2S increased the organic aerosol mass and CO2 eventually decreased the, uh, the organic aerosol mass. So what happens if we have both? How, both? How would those compete with each other? Um, so what we did is the some very similar experiments to what I showed before with uh, without CO2, um, but we're going to add CO2 from 0.1% to 2%, um, and then we're just going to keep uh, H2S constant at 5 ppm. And then we also kept the methane constant at 0.1%. Uh, and what we see is that we actually get more aerosol and we actually make sulfate aerosol. So I'm showing two mass spectra here, and then the top spectra is the aerosol mass spectrum without H2S. So this is just... 0.5% um, CO2 with 0.1% methane, no H2S, and we can see we get some organic aerosol, um, but not much else, and there's not a whole lot of it. Um, what you can see here is that in the experiment on the, the, the spectrum on the bottom is an experiment with the same concentrations of CO2 and CH4, but we included 5 ppm H2S. And you can see that just based on the scale of these, uh, the scale of the y-axis of both these spectra, that it's four times higher in the experiment with H2S. So we're getting much more organic aerosol. And what you'll also notice are these red bars, which is this sulfate or this uh, oxidized sulfur that we see when we include H2S. So we didn't see any oxidized sulfur in the experiments without CO2, which is expected because we didn't include any kind of oxygen molecule in the initial mixture. But when we have H2S with CO2, we get uh, some of this oxidized sulfur, this sulfate aerosol. So um, what we also found is that um, the sulfate that we saw increases and the organic uh, increases as a function of CO2 and the organics are constant. Um, so we'll take a step back and look at the control experiments. Um, what did those look like? So the experiments value stress. So these have been done before, but these are what I ran as my control. Um, what I'm showing in this figure is the mass loading on the left versus the CO2 concentration or the O to C ratio. And what you can see is the organic aerosol eventually decreases at high CO2. We go up and then at about 2% is when it max, or 0.2% CO2, it maxes out and then it decreases. Um, but then let's look at the experiments with H2S, with 5 ppm H2S as a function of CO2. Um, so these uh, axes are on the same scale. And then we see that if we just include H2S, the, the first is you see this red bar that's increasing. So we are getting, increasing that sulfate. Um, but what you also see is that the organic um, increases and it also remains constant as a fairly constant as a function of C, uh, CO2. So in the experiments without H2S, it eventually decreases, but just with trace 5 ppm H2S, we get more of it and it doesn't disappear. So the organic aerosol is constant at higher CO2 with trace H2S, and then we also get this sulfate. So the question is, uh, we can ask the question, is this sulfate all inorganic, like inorganic salts, like ammonium sulfate? Um, and we know in the modern atmosphere that our organosulfur or organosulfate compounds form an aerosol in the modern atmosphere. So what about in our system? So we can actually figure this out. And the answer is that the sulfate that we saw in that last slide is actually inorganic and organic. And what we can do is we can analyze the spectra to partition that sulfate into organic or organic contributions. And what we see when we do this is, is if we look at this total sulfate signal here on the left axis versus percent CO2, we see that um, at the lower concentrations of CO2, here in the maroon, this is the organic oxidized sulfur. So the organic, organic oxidized sulfur is, uh, can, is almost all of the sulfate signals, 100% of that sulfate signal. So it's, none of it is inorganic. And even at 0.5% uh, CO2, most of that sulfate signal is still organic rather than inorganic. But we start getting some inorganic sulfate at 0.5% uh, CO2. And as we increase the CO2, um, we get more of this inorganic sulfate. But even at 2% CO2, we still see this organic oxidized sulfur, this OOS. So we see this organic oxidized sulfur in the experiments with CO2, but in the experiments without CO2, we talked about that organic reduced sulfur, like thiols and sulfides. So what about that? Do we see any evidence for that in the experiments with CO2? And the answer is yes, we do see evidence for organic reduced sulfur also. So we can do the same kind of analysis that we did in the previous experiments without CO2, where we take this enhancement spectrum. 
where we have the spectrum with H2S and divide it by the spectrum of the control. So the experiment without H2S. And so here is another enhancement spectrum. So in the black is the same that I showed before. So this is without CO2. So this is the enhancement spectrum of 0.1% methane with 5 ppm H2S. So you can see all the little notches where we have all the enhancements and then you see these group things. And in the pink, this is the enhancement spectrum of the 0.1% CO2. And so what you can see is that it has a very similar pattern to the experiments without it. So we also see this very similar organic reduced sulfur pattern to the non-H2S experiments. So there's some evidence for the um, organic reduced sulfur. Another way we can look at this is if we pick a proxy ion. So meaning we pick an ion that can kind of represents uh, organic reduced sulfur. Um, we could pick it out of our spectrum. And in this case, we chose um, MZ45, which is this, the simplest uh, organic reduced sulfur compound, HCS, that we could make. Um, and we picked that also because it doesn't overlap with any of the oxidized uh, sulfur uh, peaks or the sulfate peaks. And if we take that, uh, the signals at this uh, 45 ion, and we uh, look how much that contributes to the total organic signal as a function of CO2 in the experiments with H2S versus the experiments without H2S, we can see that the experiments with 5 ppm H2S, this uh, MC45 contributes a lot more to the total organic signal than it does without H2S here in the green. Um, but if we, uh, as we increase CO2, the fraction that this contributes decreases. Um, so we're getting less and less of a contribution of organic reduced sulfur. So we're moving away from the organic reduced sulfur and moving towards the organic oxidized sulfur as the gas mixture becomes more oxidizing as we get more CO2 in the mixture. So what about H2SO4 and S8? These are you know, usually thought to be the main sulfur reservoirs um, in the arcane atmosphere. So what we looked at, we didn't look at H2SO2, but we looked at uh, H2S, which could, be, could have been another major volcanic sulfur gas. Um, and we didn't see either of these. We didn't see either of them at any concentration. So we didn't see any, the MC98 signal was just far too small compared to the other uh, oxidized sulfur signals to show any evidence for pure H2SO4 aerosol. And then the SA ion series, uh, namely MZ96, 128, 160, 192, it was just completely absent. We didn't see it. So H2S didn't produce either of these, um, even in a more oxidizing uh, mixture like with high CO2. So the overall conclusion is that H2S uh, presents a new picture of this CO2, CH4, haze, and sulfur chemistry. Um, so here I'm just showing just the overarching kind of conclusions of our studies, um, where we have uh, these boxes are each partitioned based on how much, what's the O to C ratio or how much CO2 we have going left to right. Um, so in the bottom, we have the no H2S. So this is known if we add a little bit of CO2, we get a little bit more haze. Um, but eventually that decreases. We lose some of this organic aerosol. But with H2S, we show, it shows a much, uh, much more rich chemistry. So we have, uh, with no CO2, we have organic aerosol and organic reduced sulfur. Um, as we add, if we add uh, some CO2, we get organic oxidized sulfur and organic reduced sulfur and more organic aerosol. And if we keep increasing CO2, the organic aerosol stays constant. We have, still have some organic reduced sulfur. Um, we start to make some inorganic sulfate along with our um, organic oxidized sulfur. And then eventually we just get to um, no more reduced sulfur, but we have organic oxidized sulfur and inorganic sulfate uh, with still constant organic aerosol. So some of the main conclusions, uh, trace H2S would increases organic haze even at high CO2. So without uh, H2S, CO2 eventually uh, cuts off haze production. Uh, it cuts it down. Um, we have the formation of biologically relevant molecules, such as organic sulfur molecules. And this is in combination with the other biologically relevant molecules that we uh, were talked about earlier, um, such as organic uh, nitrogen compounds. And then on H2S and haze, uh, H2S haze chemistry um, does not produce S8 or H2SO4 in our study. So these are the two main sulfur reservoirs that are currently thought of um, for uh, the arcane atmosphere 
but we showed that almost even at the at the lower CO2 concentrations, it's almost entirely organic. Um, and then this, uh, all of this can have implications for early life. Like I said, we have these um, prebiotic molecules that are formed. Um, we have sulfur being included, which is necessary for life. We can have nutrient deposition for existing life. Um, because we're changing the composition and we're changing how much haze we have, this can affect the arcane environment. So if we have a thicker haze and its composition changes, we can, this can um, affect the uh, incident light on the earth and affect the radiative forcing. It can cool it or warm it. Um, and then uh, all of this could have implication, implicate, implications on the interpretation of that sulfur mass independent fractionation, uh, uh, mass independent fractionation of isotopes. And we don't know whether this H2S haze chemistry produces the mass independent fractionation or not, but um, we could start thinking about it and more work would need to be done to see um, how that could affect the interpretation of the SMIF. Um, and with that, um, that's all I have. I'd like to thank you uh, for listening and I'd be happy to field any questions. Thank you so much, Nathan. And to all of our speakers, I'll give you all a round of applause um, since our audience uh, can't do that, but um, they can ask questions through the chat or through raising their hand. And if it's a relevant uh, question, they can do that and we'll un unmute them. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and moderate the chat for um, questions. We're getting, of course, great talks. So I do see one here um, from Ben Katie Pierce. So uh, this question's for Nick. Do we expect all the iron from the cores of large impactors to be available for oxidation? Um, and then I know the impact angle makes a difference, but is there a relation between the size of impactor and the amount of iron that spreads over the surface? Um, so yeah, not all of the iron will be available for reducing the atmosphere. Um, some of it will be plunged into the mantle and some of it will be flung out to space. And so only some fraction of the iron <clears throat> will be available in the surface environment to reduce the oceans. And uh, there's uh, Robert Citron um, in um, down at, uh, um, uh, <laughs> I can't remember which UC school, but he did some, uh, he did some modeling where he looked at, he, you know, he modeled, he did some smooth particle hydrodynamics and, and modeled these impact events and looked at where the iron would end up. And so he found that Yes, a good portion of the iron is not available. It gets, it plunges into the mantle, but something like, even in the most pessimistic cases, something like 10%, I mean, one to 10%, uh, depending on impact angle and variety of different things, um, it would still be available for reducing the surface environment. Great, thank you. And then it looks like um, we'll bounce over to Nathan for the next question that came in. So. Um, that was from Circuit. So actually it looks like there's two here. So the first is um, what is the H2S source on early earth? And then how much of the role of H2S comes from its longer cross sections, i.e. Uh, mainly from radical production? Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, so the source of H2S on the Arcan um, I think, well, um, I think it's somewhat assumed that it comes from volcanoes, just like on modern Earth. Um, but there's also biological sulfate reduction likely on the Archaean, so it could also come from surface life, just like methane would. Um, so those would be the sources of H2S. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question again? Sure, so the second part was about, well, the radical production. How much of the role from H2S comes from it's longer cross sections. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I understand the question right. So, um, is the question asking how much is that is this role from radicals H2S, or is there another pathway for this um, this chemistry to occur without H2S fertilizing? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, sure. So, how about the the first one, um, the radical role? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why it triggers this enhanced haze formation. It's um, the, the radical chemistry um, is just what I proposed because this radical chemistry, the styling click chemistry is common in synthesis. And the synthesis um, research uses like click, um, the, the term click chemistry as like this, it's very efficient. It's very, it happens um, efficiently. Um, and the, there's been studies on that um, with thiol radicals and alkenes. Um, so the reason it would enhance haze formation, uh, at least I think, um, is because of this radical propagation. So we get more sources of radicals and then because it's this very efficient chemistry between the thiol and the alkene. And then this radical propagation causes chain growth. So then this chain growth uh, causes more of the available organic uh, gases like the alkenes to be incorporated into the aerosol. That's at least what we think is going on or what we propose is going on. Great, thank you. All right, so and uh, one came in for Nick. So let's see, um, from Shiva Agarwal. And that is, uh, so you mentioned the hydrogen escape. So does that take into account the different isotopes of hydrogen having an effect on that escape? No, we do not consider uh, isotopes really at all. All right, lots of great talks in here. Uh, let's see. So this one is from Rishith Raj Brizada, and that is, is there any other way that methane was formed in the atmosphere of early Earth except for the iron rich impactor? Yes, there are other ways. Um, so one idea is that it, methane could form in deep sea uh, serpentinizing hydrothermal vents. So we have those on the earth today and we go down there with submarines and look at them. And uh, it's very confusing. We think, well, back in the day we thought they made methane and nowadays it's, I think it's unclear how much methane they produce. Um, and the problem is that there's life all over the place and life is making methane. And so how much abiotic methane is being produced by these hydrothermal vents is not completely clear, but they probably produce some. Um, and uh, so that is one source, but it's probably pretty small. Like when you put those fluxes into a model of the early earth, you get fairly tiny concentrations of methane and you don't really get any interesting prebiotic molecules. Um, another possible source is, um, so I was talking about an impact which delivered iron, which then reduced the surface environment. Another option is an impact which contains a lot of volatiles. And during the impact, that vapor plume could equilibrate in such a way to basically make some methane. So sort of a different impact mechanism. Um, and in that, it's un unclear how much methane could be made that way. And uh, it's, it's just challenging to model. It's possible that if catalysts were present in this vapor plume that could equilibrate to make methane, then you could make a lot of methane and that could be significant. But if there were no catalysts and there's just gas phase reactions, then the predicted methane concentrations are pretty small. Um, so, but when we, um, yeah, the very large impacts are um, maybe the biggest source, um, arguably the biggest source. Um, of course, that's up for debate. Very interesting, thank you. Okay, um, so we have one, for Nathan uh, from Ron Krishnamurthy. And that is, how is the UV flux or intensity uh, for photochemical reactions affected by the haze produced in your experiments? It's a good question. Um, so, um, so the UV flux um, during our experiments, um, it depends on how much methane we use. So, I mean, we don't have enough time resolution to see, you know, what the haze flux is. Um, well, we haven't actually measured actually what the haze, what the photon flux is before, you know, the haze um, is formed. So over the course of experiment. Uh, but what we have done is we know we can use the methane to go from um, uh, an optically thick regime to an optically thin regime. So if we in keep increasing the methane, 
the uh, the haze would get so thick that the actual haze production decreases in our cells. So if we have, I think it's about 0.1% methane, if I remember right, is the max amount of, uh, like that's the concentration of methane that produces the max amount of organic aerosol. So once you get above 0.1% methane, the, the haze in the reaction cell gets so thick that it actually starts interrupting that flux and starts uh, Cutting, cutting down on the chemistry to produce A. So you actually get less haze uh, than you did before. Great, thank you. Um, there was a, a bit of a follow-up from Circuit's H2S question. I think um, they were just trying to understand uh, why H2S triggers enhanced haze formation, which I think had to do with the carbon double um, on chemistry. Uh, yeah, I think I, I yeah. think I, I hope I answered that. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I see Nicholas put, Nick put in the chat that he has a question for you, Nathan, and I encourage you to just go for it. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. You did experiments for five ppm H two S, right? Um, but it kind of seems like uh, when we model H two S in the atmosphere, it gets to pretty low concentrations up high because of photolysis where the haze is produced. So I'm wondering how you think this might scale with H2S concentration, the, the haze production rate. Yeah, I mean, um, so we did lower concentrations in the non-methane, on the non-CO2 experiments, we did as low as half a ppm. Um, so, I mean, it probably scale, I'm not sure like what the relationship would be, whether it's linear or, exponen or exponential, um, but I imagine if you have some H2S, you're gonna form some kind of, if that photolyzes with methane, I, I imagine that would form some kind of organic sulfur species. But uh, it looks clearly that the, the amount of haze you form is clearly dependent on how much H2S you have. And we really don't know the like upper limit of that, um, but yeah. Thanks, yeah. So I have a question that sort of combines things from the two talks, which is, can the reaction of methane with H2S be seen as in competition of the rea reactions? Nick, you were talking about the for formation of hydrogen cyanide and um, the other one, um, but are those competing? And then a follow-up thought to that is, whether that might have an effect on that uh, problem of the temperature being too high at the surface. Um, at least from a, um, are those reactions competing? Um, I think for the bigger um, simulations I'm doing, like the bigger impacts, um, probably no, because there's a very big methane reservoir. And so, you can throw a lot of stuff at it. You know, it's such a big reservoir that it's going to persist for a long period of time. And H2S is probably a relatively small flux coming from volcanoes and, and the surface. And so it's just probably not going to affect it too much. Uh, and then Nathan, you want to take the second half? Or? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. There's a, there's a lot of methane in the atmosphere, so it could be a huge reservoir. So, um, but it also depends on how much you know, H2S and these other gases we have. Thanks. Yeah, that definitely helps answer that question there on sort of different scales. Um, so we have a question from William Saucier. Uh, this one's for Nick. Is anything known about the number and frequency of large, so greater than 1,000 kilometer impactors on early Earth? I see you're already pulling up some slides. <laughs> Oh, Nick, you're still muted. Oops. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, you can look at the moon um, and uh, the moon has craters. And we went to the moon and picked up some of those rocks and took them back here and dated them. Um, and also we have geochemistry of Earth's mantle. It tells us stuff about the impact history on Earth. So when you put all that data together, you can do sort of a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the different impact histories that are consistent with those data. And these are sort of results from those sort of Monte Carlo simulations. 
So like this plot is relevant to, to the question specifically. Um, this is the number of impactors greater than 1000 kilometers in diameter um, and the probability of different scenarios. So it could have been between zero and six, um, maybe three is the most likely number, but a handful is the probably happened. Um, so yeah. That takes us uh, to the end of the questions currently in the chat. I'll give people another moment to type any in that they may have. And um, while that may be happening, I'll just have some reminders for us. So um, a reminder that PCE3 does have a Slack channel for any and all PCE3 discussions. So I will go ahead and put the link for that in the chat. Um, yeah, so please join us there. Uh, that's the way, you know, these sort of sessions and then um, having things like Slack are the way that we sort of link together as a community. So that's there for you all. And uh, second thing, I believe that we may have just a brief poll we can put into the Slack. James will tell me if that is not true. Um, but just to get a little, there we go, a little more information on really who's here, who's coming. Um, so yeah, feel free to fill out that poll. And I guess one last reminder that um, of, of the PCE3 Twitter, um, the handle is at PCE3 underscore size. So I'm also gonna put that into the chat. So make sure to follow them. All right, so we're getting more thank yous, um, of course. And again, thank you from the organizers and from PCE3. It was great talks today. I learned so much about reducing atmospheres um, that will help me in what I do in the future. So I think we are clear to head out. All right. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks again for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much.